Yeah. Are you still an undergrad or you switched to a master? I'm a master. Yeah. Nice. Exciting. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Are you taking more research stuff or? No, I'm just. For my undergrad, I was going to get 50 and 60 credit hours. Mm -hmm. But as a grad, that's what Yeah, it's not the thing. Yeah. Like, I'm at now, you're right now. So gotcha. Awesome. Cool. Good. Have fun. Thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me try to make my voice louder. Is this better? Okay, I think it is. Okay. Um, all right, welcome, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see this room so packed. Last, uh, last year, we had about 10 of us, so this is a completely new situation. Um, I hope you stick around, and I hope today's lecture will kind of give you a sense of what we are going to do in this course so um, you can see for yourself whether this is something you really was look looking for. So first of all, uh, my name is Anna Marasovic, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I will talk a little bit later in today about how to go about communicating and course logistics. So for now, this is my name, refer to me any way you want. Um, I think most elegant is when you just call me professor without using my uh, not super simple last name. All right, so um, what I'm gonna do today is just give you kind of like an overview of all the topics we are going to talk about uh, in this course. And we are going to start with kind of acknowledging that AI or machine learning, however, however you call it, is kind of becoming an integral part of our lives, right? We use all sorts of AI tools and all sorts of devices. And with ChatGPT becoming a thing last year, this has, I think, really uh, become kind of obvious to, to everyone. So uh, before we had, uh, you know, super neat technologies like ChatGPT, we had simpler machine learning techniques such as, you know, spam filter that you uh, all have used. And the way you could develop a, a machine learning based spam filter is to take a 
some kind of uh, collects a bunch of emails that uh, you know maybe your users have already labeled as spam or not spam use your favorite machine learning uh, uh, tool, um, not really a tool, like an uh, algorithm, such as neural network these days, you would train it on this data, you would have a train model, and then this you could use this train model to predict whether a new email is spam or not. And although obviously we all want to use spam filter, um, these days situation with machine learning and AI technologies has become a little bit more complicated. So uh, these days we are also kind of having an ambition to apply it to more high stakes situations. So it is not unheard of, and actually there are whole AI startups around this to take clinical notes written by actual clinicians train a neural network to predict whether a person, you know, should be admitted to a hospital or not, or maybe uh, whether they are sick or not, or whatever next step in their healthcare they should get. And here, um, you know, even AI people don't want to just use this uh, without uh, having any person in the loop. So very often we would have some clinician, some domain expert in this situation that will look at this outputs of this tool and then they will make a final prediction of whether this person is sick or not and inform, uh, inform the patient. The problem here is that this model, uh, this neural network is what we call a black box model. It means that unlike your traditional programs that where you kind of write instructions of what's going to happen and how your program is going to approach solving the problem, here you are having a bunch of random numbers that you then give data. These random numbers turn into some not random numbers anymore. And then this whole set of numbers can make predictions for you. But you don't know exactly how the model solved the problem. You don't know exactly which kind of rules or pattern it, uh, it has used. And with these models becoming bigger and data becoming bigger, this problem of understanding how the model came to solve this, uh, this whole thing is becoming more and more challenging. So, you know, um, it is kind of a situation for both doctors and patients that we don't really, you know, super willingly engage with these things. You know, as a patient, obviously, if a doctor just nearly really use these outputs, you might get hurt. You might get seriously hurt. Um, as, a, as a doctor, you might be like, oh, I don't know. This is, you know, I, I've been a doctor for a while. I have my own way of dealing with these things. I don't want to use this tool tools, but the reality is that it's harder to opt out, you know, like clinicians have their supervisors, hospital managers that might say, well, listen, we just don't have enough human resources and you must, you know, uh, make more decisions daily. And maybe the only way for you to make more good decisions is to collaborate with these tools. As a, as a patient, you might not have, a, have any saying in the matter, you know, maybe this is the way that the decision is made um, on you and you don't even no, unfortunately. So don't want to be a big bum, bummer here, uh, but uh, I do want to highlight that it's harder to opt out. So these questions around what is said called explainability, why is this input assigned this answer become more and more relevant, which brings us all here today to learn how can we provide answers to, to questions such as why is this why is this input assign uh, this answer? So why is this Based on this clinical note, the model uh, decided to say that uh, this person is sick or not sick. And there are different ways we can approach this question with, you know, in, a, in terms of uh, techniques we can apply. And uh, we can answer which, for example, input words or image patches, if we are working with images, are responsible for the prediction. Uh, we might choose to say, well, I, I will just show how certain my model is uh, in this prediction. Uh, we can maybe show some human uh, interpretable concept. For example, in a clinical domain, it is known that certain um, kind of um, high level information about images is related to certain uh, uh, diagnosis, such as uh, you know predicting certain type of diabetes from the images of eyes. Um, we might want to be more, you know, technically versed and ask, well, tell me which kind of training examples the model have seen that it caused it to now, for this new instance, predict that um, something is true. And you might just be like, okay, just tell me in plain English, 
why, why, uh, why is the model predicting this? So we are going to cover techniques that are going to aim to address these kind of uh, questions or relating to this bigger one here, why is this input assigned this sensor? But we will also look into what would need to be different in the input uh, to model to give uh, another, another answer. Um, Today, I will just quickly go about the techniques we are going to use to answer these about six questions. Uh, but by no means, you should understand fully what these techniques are, just to get the impression of like, how, how are we going to go about these questions? I want to also emphasize that uh, what has happened in explainability world from machine learning or AI point, researchers' point of view is very different from this whole thing where I talk about human AI collaboration and we want to have these explanations to truly be useful to something and then we go about evaluating them for usefulness. For a while, these techniques uh, were these techniques that make predictions weren't so good. Like we didn't have chat GPT. So researchers, practitioners had to narrow their focus. And by narrowing our focus, we worked on tasks that aren't really something we would do in real world. And then we produce some explanations. And then because we didn't have actual applications to start with, we never actually evaluated them for the utility, for how truly useful they are. What we focused on are two basically aspects of explanations. One is called plausibility. The other one is called faithfulness. Plausibility is basically your kind of how satisfied you are with a given explanation. I would, if you were my annotator at the platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk, I would just ask you, hey, do you think this explanation justifies this answer? And you would tell me, yeah, it does. And I would be like, great, my explanation is plausible, but I don't really know uh, whether it is useful. Uh, faithfulness, still very relevant, is some kind of measurement that tells us that the explanations we are providing is truly uh, the reason why the model makes prediction, predictions, uh, this prediction uh, that the explanation is produced for. And the reason why we care about this is because these models are so powerful, they have ability to tell us these are the reasons, but in the background, they could use something completely uh, different. So we need ways to ensure that the reasons we are getting out of the model are truly those that are uh, that the model had used to make a prediction. Okay, I will just talk a little bit more, then I'll stop. I hope you can uh, still follow. So what I'm saying here, for a while, explainability techniques were kind of evaluated in a way that was a little bit shallow. And I want to give you an illustration of how how explanation that is plausible or faithful doesn't necessarily need to be um, useful. And this kind of setup is what we are gonna start to think more and more about as this, uh, this uh, class goes. So we will think about human AI teams. We have AI, we have a model that's trained on some data. We have some domain expert, and this domain expert is collaborating with this AI to make a final prediction. And ideally, we would like that the AI and the person is playing off each other's strengths. So we want their complementary performance to be better than if they are acting as, uh, you know, solo. So that's the goal. And here we have an, uh, an example, running example of a doctor collaborating with an AI that makes a prediction of whether someone is sick or not but eventually they are the ones that make the final prediction. And these are different situations that may happen. The initial human prediction could be correct or wrong. Then they get see the AI advice. AI advice can be correct or wrong. And uh, we can have different situation that follows after that. So initially person might be correct. They see incorrect advice from uh, AI and they say, well, they recognize that the AI is fishy here and they are like, no, I'm gonna stick with my own decisions and they have correct self-reliance. Opposed to that is that they are tricked or misled by the AI's advice and then they shift and switch their prediction, which was originally correct, into an incorrect one. And he would, here we would have a case of over-reliance. So these are different situations as, uh, that might happen here. So, um, Commonly, explanations are introduced to say, well, if I introduce explanations, they might avoid these situations that we don't like, such as over-reliance. 
For example, we might show explanation that reveals some kind of inconsistencies with the model's reasoning that prompt the person to say, oh, I, there is something kind of tricky going on here. I, I, I'm going to stick with my initial guess, which was, let's say, correct. So explanation have potentially this power to push people into the right direction. But it is an ongoing research direction. You know, we don't have super strong evidence that explanations are truly helpful for these things we are saying they might be helpful for, and they are not always bad either. So it is very active area of research, what we are going to talk about uh, in this course. Anyway, um, imagine that we have this situation. Initially, person is uh, correct. Uh, then they see incorrect models advice, and then uh, they see explanation. And explanation um, says, uh, they, they show some kind of flawed reasoning. And then person is like, eh, this is flawed. I'm going to stick with my own. And then they are correct. So they can be helpful in this way. Or maybe the person was incorrect. They see correct uh, AI's advice. AI uh, explanation shows that this model is actually reasoning in a, in a solid way. And the person switches their prediction to the, to the AI's prediction, which was correct. So these are the ways that explanations could help improve appropriate reliance. But going back to what I said that, you know, um, we, we kind of care about plausibility and faithfulness for a while and the utility here approving, let's say, correct uh, reliance do not necessarily need to be aligned. This can happen, for example, if we have correct human decision, they see incorrect AI's advice, and then they change their, their uh, prediction to be um, AIs. And now they have over-reliance. This can happen because a person might find the reasoning somewhat plausible. You know, maybe there isn't something extremely flawed in it. It's just not the super correct one, which is very common the case with ChatGPT these days. It's kind of on topic, but then it's just the logic is not really on point. So person might say, you know what, I kind of find this explanation satisfactory. I think it's plausible. And indeed, this might be the exact reason why the model made a prediction. So it's also faithful. But it had prompted the person to over rely on AI. Therefore, it is not only not, it's, it's definitely not useful. It's also misleading, kind of opposite of useful. So we have a case where explanation is plausible, faithful, but not uh, not useful. Okay, so I know this is a lot. There is a lot of, you know, imagine this, then that. Again, the point isn't that you get everything here. I just wanted to give you kind of a hint that we are going to go over techniques and we are going to focus on plausibility, faithfulness, and then I will introduce the ways to focus on applications, on application grounded evaluations with actual people with that focus on really directly evaluating utility of these explanation, which is ongoing area of research. So as the time goes, we will focus more and more on these uh, situations, just to try to kind of put you in the mindset of what we are gonna talk about uh, in the course. So before the fall break, we are gonna focus on machine learning, AI, explainability methods, drilling, training uh, perspective, and then we are gonna focus on, okay, let's try to make these things truly, truly useful. And let's talk about how to make them, how to make that, how to evaluate them, whether uh, they are, uh, that they are useful. So we are gonna focus on who, uh, why are we bringing these explanations? Who are the people? What should we include in, in this explanation? And then go back into, uh, checking that we really fulfill that uh, initial initial goal. Okay, so uh, as promised, I wanna go like through over these uh, methods quickly and then uh, we are gonna go talk about course logistics. I wanna stop for just a brief moment to see whether there are any immediate re reactions to the things I said. Yeah, please. So I'm just kind of curious. Um, mm -hmm. 
So this course mainly going to be looking at like the outputs and how explainable those are, or is like is it going to be looking at how like in terms of the large language model, for example, like how those outputs are created, like where mm -hmm. the inputs are going. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I wouldn't say it's either of those things, but I think um, you are also kind of asking, are we going to look into the internals of the large language models? So we are for sure going to use large language models, and you are going to be expected to be able to um, take one of those and fine tune it. Now I'm using the term that I'm going to introduce later on, but you're going to use this pre-trained language model, fine-tuning, meaning train it for the task. So you are going to deal with like inputs, outputs, and training of the model. But once you have the model trained, we are going to focus on kind of introducing methods that can tell us why, why this output is given, which will require, again, sometimes training some other models or training the models in a way that both gives us the label and the explanation jointly and so on. But what we are not going to do, um, we are not going to pro talk about global analysis of models. So for example, we will learn that we are going to focus on an architecture, neural network architecture called transformers. It will have certain components and we could let's say, remove one of those components, and then we can check the effects on the model performance. And then if the performance drop, we can say, well, this component was important. For example, we are not going to do stuff like that. So we are not going to talk about this global analysis of these models that gives us insights into like how exactly with exact internals they are coming to, to their uh, predictions. We are going to focus on inputs and outputs mostly. Mostly, yeah. Um, yeah, and these are super interesting stuff. I think the future of this course is to kind of combine the stuff we are gonna talk about with these uh, global uh, global methods. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let, let's go just quickly over the kinds of techniques uh, we are going to learn about and learn how to apply uh, to these models. Please feel free to interrupt me anytime you have any questions, raise a hand or uh, just start talking. Um, yeah, uh, and these are going to be like very quick without any details, obviously, uh, just to give you an impression of, of these uh, techniques. So for most, we need our artifact. We are going to an analyze and those are uh, going to be pre-trained language models or vision. Um, models mostly. So this is what we are going to do in the next lecture this Wednesday. We are going to solely focus on the transformer neural network architecture. We are not going to talk about convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, none of those, just transformers. And transformers, we are going to go into the details of it is in the most simplest terms, a stack of encoder and decoder sometimes. Uh, blocks and each one of these blocks is um, composed by something called self-attention and a small feedforward neural network. You might have heard about feedforward neural network. Most likely, if you never heard about transformers, you don't know what self-attention is, and that's fine. We are just going we are going to talk about that uh, on uh, this Wednesday. Um, we are going to talk about pre-training and fine-tuning. I think I already mentioned a few times this term. It's kind of impossible for me not to say it, probably. Uh, but this is very simple. Uh, the way these uh, models that we are using in natural language processing and in computer vision are trained is by doing a long stage of initial training called pre-training, where you are using uh, data that you do not need to label by human annotators. And in NLP, for example, we found two uh, such objectives for uh, doing this long initial phase of training called pre-training. One is to take your text that you have scraped from the internet, randomly mask a few 15% of words by replacing them with a you know, literal word mask. And then you train the model to recover what was the original word. 
Other objective is that you start with the first word and then train the model to predict the next one. And you know what the next one is because you have the piece of text. So these are the kind of the pre-training objectives we can use to train for a long time using terabytes and terabytes of data. And then we are gonna fine tune our model, which is just a standard supervised um, machine learning that I expect you have heard uh, in some form before. Um, and we, I will go through various kinds of uh, transformers because they are going to be useful when we are talking about different explainability techniques. Not super important right now, just so you know that they will come in different uh, flavors. And we are also going to talk about inputs that are not not only text, but also images. And kind of luckily for us, these architectures that people use these days have converged to the same thing, transformers. So there is something called vision transformer today. And for me, it's going to just be important that you understand how do we put an image into a transformer architecture. Uh, that's going to be important for the explainability techniques we are going to talk about. But it's, you know, the state of the art model. If you are needing any kind of vision model, you are going to use a transformer uh, architecture likely, and it's going to be pre-trained. And when you use a pre-trained transformer for vision tasks, it's most likely going to be a uh, clip if you are doing classification tasks. So again, something we are going to talk about uh, next, uh, next time. Uh, we are also going to focus when we talk about explainability techniques and models on the current uh, you know, situation, which is that this second stage of training called fine tuning these days is kind of disappearing. We have smaller and smaller data to the point that we have no data uh, anymore. For example, when you interact with ChatGPT, you are just asking it questions, or we didn't explicitly train it for that question you are asking, uh, or that task you are deeming it can do. Uh, you are just trying it out, and it is uh, possible that it will it will do what you are asking it to do. So, you know, for example, we can ask reasoning of you know ChatGPT to give us reasoning together with his uh, 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 prediction. And not only that, we can ask it, it will give its reasoning by default. So here I took uh, some kind of claim I found in one of the standard NLP data sets. And it didn't just answer yes or no, is it true that this is the case? It actually gave us a bunch of information, which is basically uh, the reasoning for that prediction. So it is the case that these days, we also need to ground everything we talk about in these kinds of techniques, because the explainability techniques we have from before are not necessarily going to be used in the exact same way they were originally introduced. And it's kind of, again, active area of research to understand what kind of modifications we need to do on those techniques for them to be relevant today. So we are gonna bring up this kind of situation a lot during this course and kind of together try to understand, okay, is that technique from three years ago relevant? And if so, in which way? Okay, so once we are done, once we understand what our model is, uh, we are going to move into uh, the simplest form of explanation, which is, um, uncertainty value for the prediction. So I mentioned that we are gonna think about these human AI teams. And if we are interested in the studying of effects of explanations on reliance, appropriate reliance, accepting correct predictions, rejecting incorrect predictions, then an easy way to kind of hint a person into the right direction might be to tell person, well, I think uh, I'm predicting this, this person is sick, and I'm 87% confident. Um, I'm kind of talking as if the model is a person, which is really bad, but bear with me. Uh, it's, it's easier. Um, and if a person sees these kinds of outputs, they might say, well, then I am going to say this person is sick because you know, if the model is this confident about it, that, that seems fine. But on the other side, it might be that the model is really not confident about this prediction. And then person upon seeing this should be like, okay, um, I don't really wanna trust this. So I'm gonna do this whole thing by myself, for example. So this is how this um, confidence or uncertainty values could be very helpful. And this is going to be our control, our baseline 
once we start to think about these human AI teams. So any kind of experiment we do has to be complemented by this as a baseline. If you are introducing explainability methods and you're saying my explanation can help person have better appropriate reliance and human AI team performance, it must be better than this one because this one is the simplest. Um, and uh, next week, we are going to talk about how can we calculate this uncertainty uh, estimates, which is not necessarily terribly complicated, but what, if we want to have really good uncertainty values, it gets complicated. So that's why they are not you know, solving this whole problem of uh, achieving appropriate uh, reliance in human items. Any questions? All right, so once we learned what our model is, how to train it, how to get uncertainty values out of it, we are going to move on to answering the question, why is this input assigned this answer? And we are going to spend about four weeks just on this question using different uh, techniques. And our first technique is going to be something called free text explanations or these days known as chain of thoughts. So these techniques just gives us in plain English the answer to why is this input assigned this label. And I will just show you, kind of illustrate this with an example. Here you can imagine uh, this elderly woman is um, looking at her social media feed, and, excuse me, and she encountered this post that says, um, I'm so happy I just learned this. I'm uh, as an American over 65, I qualified for the elderly spend card, which pays for my groceries, my dental, and my prescription refills. All I did to qualify was the tab the image below, enter my zip, and I got my flex card in the mail next week uh, later. And you can imagine that on social media platform, you have some kind of neural network that is uh, telling us whether this post is factually correct or not. And let's say that this, um, model in the background says, well, this post is misleading. Now, this uh, woman upon seeing, well, this post exists, it is misleading, might wonder where, you know, I see that there is a lot of people who already registered this for this. There are a lot of likes on this post. So if people were scammed, why were they liking this and so on? So maybe she could righteously wonder, am I missing out on this? Am I missing out on this uh, great uh, uh, opportunity? Maybe she interacted with this model before it was wrong. And now she's like, oh, is this thing uh, incorrect again? These are all legit questions to, to wonder about, I think. So what can be useful here is that we give this person an explanation, but an explanation in a form that this person can easily understand. And that's to say that not every American over 65 can get these cars since they are not provided by Medicare, the federal health insurance program for senior citizens. They are offered as a benefit to some customers by private insurance companies and so on and so on. I want to read the whole thing. So this is a form of a local explanation that explains the prediction. Um, it is given in plain language and it immediately provides the gist of why is this label, uh, is this input label as it is. Um, you know, when I was in a job market like a year and a half ago, this was my futuristic example of a generation of explanations in this form. Today, the field has so quickly changed that I was like, oh my God, can ChatGPT actually answer this uh, properly. Um, I don't have a screenshot because I tried it right before the class, but um, if I if I say, is it true that uh, American over 65 qualify for the elderly spend cards? It says that it is a language model trained in September, 2021, and it doesn't, it didn't hear about the these uh, elderly spend cards. I was like, okay, good. Not everything is sold, I guess. Um, but I then prompted it to it like, okay, but what uh, what if I tell you that Medicare Advantage is kind of connected with this whole thing, thing? And then it said, oh yeah, I forgot about that or something like that. And and it gave me something that is not super, not really, um, you know, exactly this, but not you know uh, totally off topic as well. The problem was that it wasn't really 
concentrated on the main information. It gave me just like a huge document with uh, a lot of information about insurance plans, which kind of misses the point of these types of explanations that they really need to be concise and give you the gist of reasoning such that you can act on that information without being you know, cognitively overloaded. So anyway, these things are so, still very relevant today. And um, what we are gonna talk about is how do we go about generating these words automatically? Any questions about this example? Okay, are you excited that we can generate something like this? I think it's pretty neat. <laughs> it wasn't the case, you know, in 2018. In 2018, when we tried to generate anything, it would output like one repetitive word, like, uh, I don't know, A or D, 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 and it would never stop. So, you know, the questions revolving around, oh, if we generate stuff like that, how does it help people? Or what does it change, up, you know, about their... Uh, interaction with technology are super new and they become relevant only recently. So I'm excited. Um, all right, so the next method we are gonna talk about, and I wanna give you just a slide. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you are going to generate it. So it's an automatically generated, uh, explanation which is here is a sequence of words yeah exactly you train it we call this paradigm sequence to sequence and so basically you would train a model to generate this whole sequence misleading which is a label because and then explanation words to the model is just a sequence but yeah it's the sequence is has a special structure that's labeled because explanation Did I see a hand here or I'm imagining things? Yeah, you're accurate. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, what I was about to say is a little historical perspective. This type of explanations are actually kind of what had emerged on the scene very recently. So these are maybe like the latest uh, types, of, types of explainability techniques. And I intentionally put them forward to kind of start with like, okay, this is what we can do today, but let's kind of now step back and think about explainability techniques that were proposed before. And one of these techniques uh, for a while, the most prominent is still very relevant one is an explainability technique where we show parts of the inputs that are responsible for the prediction. And this comes with many names. I'm uh, adapting highlighting uh, uh, as a name of this, but you might have heard it as input attribution or Selenium maps. If you work with images, it has many names. And one of the most prominent uh, techniques for producing uh, highlights or attribution or saliency map is a gradient based uh, explanations. Uh, and this, this type of explainability technique uh, is, is based on a, on a very high level idea that kind of connects many techniques, not just gradient based. And that's to calculate the relative importance of each feature in the input compared to other features. So when we work with text, our features are words or tokens. When we work with images, our features are pixels. So we are actually saying, how is uh, this pixel, what is its importance relev relative to all the pixels in the, in the image? And importance is loosely defined, but most often it is kind of thought of as, if I remove this pixel, or if I remove this word from the input, how will the models, uh, prediction change. How, can someone tell me what do you expect will happen if I change, uh, if I remove, uh, literally delete the more important word uh, in the input? What will happen with the prediction? Yeah. Uh, that particular word may have some weightage of the final loss or something which we use. So removing that removes the loss of that, which causes your uh, reasoning to bad or similar issues with our, your accuracy. 
yeah, so I, I agree with your takeaway that the, the performance will degrade, right? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure about the loss part, especially because we are doing this um, after we have trained the model. So, but the takeaway is, is correct. If we had removed the important word for the prediction, then if we try to predict again with the incomplete input, then the performance, the, the model's prediction should, should change because that word was important for its making its uh, original prediction. Does anyone remember from calculus, like something that measures if we add small changes to our input variables, how it will make effects on the output? You are all very quiet. 13% confident. Can someone say it louder? Derivative. Derivative. Perfect. Yes, exactly. So derivative is the mathematical technique we know that computes exactly this. If we make small, infinite changes to our input variables, it gives us how much our output variable uh, will, will change. Um, so we are gonna use derivative and because we work with high dimensional spaces, we are gonna use uh, gradients. So let me show you two examples of this. Once we have calculated gradients and the magnitudes and everything that we're gonna talk about in a few weeks, um, imagine here we have a very uh, important task in NLP called mask language modeling, where you are masking one word. Here we have the doctor ran to the emergency room to see mask patient. And the model has predicted that instead of the uh, mask, we should have a uh, word his. So the model is uh, deeming that this complete sentence should be, the doctor ran to the emergency room to see his patients. And then if you use one of these gradient attribution or highlighting methods, uh, we can find top two words for predicting that instead of mask, we should have had word his. And According to this model, whatever it was in the background, the most important two words are doctor and patient. And because the word doctor is so highlighted and because pronoun his has been predicted, you can now speculate that the model has, is exhibiting potentially uh, gender bias here that is correlating uh, uh, professions like doctor more with pronouns his than uh, other pronouns. Um, for images, these things have been super prominent. For images, this is uh, mostly where they emerge. So for images, you will find the pixels that were uh, most important for predicting each one of these uh, images with the corresponding uh, label here. And uh, one thing you can see here is that they're all, <laughs> so some of them are just plain bad, but some of them start to look very similar. And uh, this paper where this image is from, sorry, I forgot to add citations here, um, compare these uh, methods with a simple uh, edge detector, which is some kind of rule-based system that tells you what are the edges of objects in the image. And uh, what they say in the paper is like your very smart uh, gradient-based method that is should be connected to, uh, to the um, actual data and model weights is actually just doing uh, edge detection. So this is one example with these methods can be um, actually not doing something super smart as we think uh, they are. So we are going to talk uh, about this issue when we come to this. Okay, but I should really move on to other things. There, are, there is so much to, to say. Uh, any, any questions about input attribution and gradients? Okay, I'll try to speed up a little bit because I, I think we are gonna run uh, out of time before we get into the logistics. Uh, the next method is to, here we look at individual features, but you might be wondering like uh, how the connection between two features, two words or two pixels is uh, responsible for the prediction. And here we are going to dwell on uh, self-attention, which is that component I mentioned in the, uh, in the transformers. And, um, Self-intention, I don't want to now go into technical details, but it's a, a product of two matrices. And when you calculate that products, you are going to get a matrix that's going to be self-attention matrix of the size of input length 
in and input line. So it's a square matrix of size input line. And basically, um, here, for example, we have uh, he was becoming agitated. Um, and then um, on, on uh, you know, column side, we have the same sentence. Basically, each weight here tells you the importance of a word for other words in the input. So here, uh, for example, we have a uh, high weights between word he and becoming agitated. And looking at this and knowing anything about language and linguistics, you can be like, maybe this attention head, maybe this weights here are capturing subject object, um, excuse me, subject uh, main verb uh, relations in a sentence. So you now learn something about relations of the words uh, in a sentence rather than the words uh, individually. Uh, we can go even higher. So we have individual words, then connections between two words. We can talk about concepts. And concepts are really hard to define. I don't want to even try to uh, try to do that here. Uh, but it's something like higher level in, in an image. So here, uh, for example, we have uh, two images. We have uh, the, the prediction by a model that this is cash machine, but here uh, it's focusing on the sliding doors. If we use those gradient-based input attribution that I mentioned before, these are the attributions. What can you see from here? Do you get anything about why the model made these predictions? Not really, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> They're kind of like blobs or nothing, right? So you can, um, you know, maybe for here, the, the original author of these slides, um, Bin Kim, um, she raised these questions. Okay, did the glasses or uh, paper matter more, human concept matter more, and so on. Um, it's gonna become a little bit clearer with the next uh, slide. Here we have just a very silly task of predicting whether an image is a zebra, showing a zebra or not. And you probably can imagine that the stripedness concept, whatever that is, is important for predicting whether an animal in image is zebra or not. And that's these are the kinds of things we can test with the technique we are gonna introduce. We can test whether the concept of stripedness is important for predicting whether a picture shows zebra or not. And how we do that is we collect a bunch of images that call, include stripes and a bunch of images that do not include stripes. We train some model on it, and then we have a classifier that can classify images as showing stripes or not. And that classifier is going to have a decision boundary, and we can take the vector that's orthogonal to that decision uh, boundary. So it's uh, important to separate these two classes, stripedness or no stripedness. And then as before with gradients where our, we were adding tiny change to our input features, now we are adding tiny change with respect to that vector. And then we check how the output changes. If the output changes a lot with respect to this vector representing stripedness, then we can say that this concept of stripedness was important for predicting whether these images are zebras or not. And this is what happened here. So eventual call will be called TCAD. And here we have three concepts, dotted, striped, or zigzagged. And you can see that the TCAD score for stripedness is really high compared uh, to, the, to the other concepts. This is a very silly task. You will never, it's never useful for anything. Uh, this actual paper that introduced this had a real world task of predicting whether an image of an eye uh, shows a sign of a retinal diabetes. And doctors have said, these are certain concepts that are we use to predict whether this uh, image of an eye has this kind of issue or not. And then in this paper, they have tested and show that uh, in certain cases, the model is using the same concepts, which is really good. You are using, that means that the model is using the exact same way that the, the human clinician uh, would go about predicting that issue. Okay, questions? Yeah. Can you do something like a principal component analysis to get features rather than specifying them beforehand? 
Yeah, so with transformers and neural network architectures, we will never specify features. And they're all gonna be vector that have no meaning with their dimensions. So your word, I say feature, when I say feature, it's a word. That means you have your, let's say clinical node, and each one of those words will just be represented with some vector. But I never design features manually, such as, you know, certain linguistic features, object, verb relations, and so on. So we'd never design them manually. And in terms of getting the concepts out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, the nice thing with DCAV is that all you need are, is the data that uh, you have portion of the data that represents that concept and portion that does not. So it's kind of flexible, but you do need to start with the concept yourself. So. Uh, it will not tell you, let's take the example with retinal diabetes, it will not tell you, ah, I use this concept and it means something like, you know, something that actual clinicians know. Um, yeah, so I think if you would like the model to do that step, then those explanations in plain language that I mentioned before are probably a better way to go about this. But this is more principled and more controllable than free text explanations, as we'll see. OK, uh, the last technique for answering why is this input assigned this sensor deals with data influence. And that's which training examples were responsible for these predictions. So you know, with input highlights, we get our prediction. And then we go back to the input and we say, these bits and pieces are important for the predictions. With free text explanations, we just add the uh, explanation as the part of the output. But when we are dealing with these models, the, the major part is the training data itself. So it's not just about inputs, outputs, it's about what we are have trained the model. So with data influence, we can kind of speculate about this situation. We can have our uh, net neural network that's trained on our full training data. And it might, for your image, predict it's a dog with very high confidence. And now you can retrain your neural network, but take one example, one training example at a time. And when you take one training example, you train the neural network, you can then check what the, that neural network is predicting for the same image. And it might say dog, but the confidence is way smaller. And then you can say, all right, I think, um, I think that this uh, training examples, uh, example had been important for the model because once I have removed it, again, the the, we have a large change in the output in terms of confidence. What is the issue with this procedure? Yeah. It was like really intense to calculate what the output, like, there was the output would be minus 20 seconds, really crazy. Yeah, we would retrain the whole thing and we would need to do it for every single training example we have. So when we have, when we talk about machine learning training data, we can have thousands of tens of thousands of instances, if not more. So that would require training as many uh, neural networks just to check for this, uh, check how the output would change. So data influence is all about approximating that process. We will not literally take one example, retrain it, uh, and check the drop in the confidence. And this is a very neat example of how older techniques can be useful for the most recent stuff we want to do. So original authors of the kind of first paper that look into this in the machine learning context, they had said, well, there is this nice classical techniques from the 70s. Let's use it for calculating data influence. And they did that, it's super influential paper. The issue with that is that it's still slow for the modern neural network architecture. So this is a follow-up paper from the 2021. And they say, well, finding the most influential examples with these um, uh, influence functions techniques that I mentioned before, um, and for a model of really small size these days uh, with 390K examples uh, takes more than two hours. So you still need to take, you know, wait a lot of time to, to get these uh, training uh, uh, examples that are influential for your prediction. 
So in this paper, they had introduced certain things that can speed up this whole process. And most recently, a couple of weeks ago, one of the uh, important AI startups, Anthropic, had uh, applied this on an even bigger, uh, bigger scale. So this continues to be important um, technique. And finally, um, so far we have focused on why did my model make this prediction? Uh, another question you can ask is, why did my model predict this label instead of another label? And uh, answering this question is very human. When we are giving explanation in, to each other, very often those explanations are contrastive. They are, they are answering why this and not that, even though we kind of uh, imagine the contrafactual in our head, the contrastive case. We don't explicitly ask why this, not that, but when in our heads, that's kind of what we are actually hearing. So I'm gonna go back to the example with the uh, with the uh, elderly lady. Uh, so we had like, why is this post uh, misleading? And um, imagine that another woman had written this original post and now she might see, oh my God, my post is flagged as being uh, misleading. I really don't wanna be misleading on the internet. How can I fix that? So we can use one of these techniques where we would uh, change the, her post in a way that would change the label from misleading into a correct information. And if you remember that free text explanation I have said, it's, it was more or less about specifying the information correctly. So uh, she would need to say not as an American over 65, but rather someone who has private health insurance play, plan with the Medicare Advantage plan, lives in certain location and is unfortunately chronically ill. So she would need to specify this more correctly. And that might be very nice thing for her to see to like how to change uh, this post. So these kinds of contrastive explanations where we edit the input text to see how the label will change are contra called contrastive edits. And we are going to talk uh, about how to produce them, how to produce these contrastive edits after we train the model, but they are by no means the only technique for producing contrastive um, explanations. Okay, so that quick tour brings us to the fall break. So everything we are gonna talk about, uh, everything I mentioned is uh, are the techniques where we are going to talk about the fall break. Don't worry, I will not now talk about every single thing we are, uh, we are going to do after the fall break. I just want to remind you that um, I will try to bring more of those real world application grounded uh, evaluations with actual people and how we can go about it. So we, we are going to talk about like a little bit about human behavior, which is uh, part of psychology and psychology as a field deals with people. We are going to bring that to our algorithms, think about how we can change our explainability techniques to consider what we have learned about people and then once we have changed our algorithms to be more appropriate for people, we are going to go back to them and evaluate whether those algorithms really have the utility within uh, we might, they might have um, for them. Um, instead of saying, oh, this explanation is plausible, but we don't know whether it's useful. And we have already talked about this. We are going to focus on local explanations. So everything here is we have a prediction for a single instance, and then we try to explain why the model had uh, predicted that single instance. Uh, we are not going to talk about global behaviors. We are not going to tweak into uh, to, uh, internals. There is a very nice uh, line of work called mechanistic interpretability these days which is kind of trying to reverse engineer neural networks. That's all very, very, very cool. It's not something we are going to talk about in this course. Only transformers, we are not gonna talk about any non-neural models. So uh, no decision trees or things like that, no covenants, no LSTMs. And we will look solely at applications in NLP and computer visions just because I know those <laughs> applications. So we are not going to talk about any kind of applications involving tabular data where you have those features that are actually meaningful such as income or age. So you can get weights on those features and it's easy to say, okay, combination of age and income was 
you know, important for certain uh, outcome, which is a lot of data science applications. Nothing in uh, robotics, although robotics involves vision, so you might find some comment, co connection, games, biology. Uh, I don't know about stuff like that, so unfortunately that's going to be uh, not represented in this course very well. And please go and check the uh, schedule to see, you know, um, more concretely about uh, the topics that are going to be in this course. Okay, so I want to talk about course logistics, but maybe let's take just a minute to kind of refresh, I guess, uh, and then I will talk about how you are going to be evaluated and stuff like that. Hopefully we get through everything. Okay, let's let's uh, continue. Two minutes passes really quickly. Um, all right, so uh, I, I want to start with the evaluation. There are three, no, how many? Uh, four components to, to the grade. Homework assignments, which are programming assignments, project, uh, paper discussion, and the final quiz uh, or exam, I recall. Um, I'm trying to make modifications for a handful of undergraduate students that are uh, enrolled in this class, but if you want to come here and talk to me after this lecture, if you're undergrad about any kind of changes you would like to see, I'm happy to integrate them. Um, this is a little bit, you know, I would say uh, not super simple course for an undergrad student, and I'm really happy to to accommodate whatever seems to be uh, the best for you. Not everything. I'll think about it, of course, but uh, just let me know. So the first thing well, that's on my slide here is the six in-person uh, paper discussion session. We are going to follow the format of the role-playing seminar where there will be a couple of roles that are documented here. Please open this and read it carefully. Uh, everywhere I say, please read carefully, please do so because there is too much information for me to go and read out uh, here in the class but it's all important information for understanding how you're going to be 
um, evaluated. Basically, we are all going to read a paper or two, and then you will be assigned some role. And sometimes you are going to present it, the paper as if you were the original author and you are presenting at the conference. Sometimes you'll need to find a paper that is cited in the paper we are reading and tell us a little bit about that paper, stuff like that. And this, all of these sessions will follow what we have talked about in previous lecture. For example, we are going to talk about gradient-based attribution. Then in this paper discussion that follows after that session, we are going to discuss like another uh, paper that speaks about the aspects I didn't cover in the lecture. Um, all of these will be in person. So um, there is a lot of things where I expect you to be in person. So um, if you cannot, or if, you, if there is a lot of sessions you cannot uh, attend, that's going to be a problem. I'm not taking the attendance for the lecture. So if you can't come to the lecture, that's fine. And I will post um, the videos on the YouTube channel so you can check those uh, later. Um, and we are going to start to discuss papers only in the third week of the class. So first two weeks, it's going to be just me talking over here. Um, there are different roles. Uh, some of those roles are to write like a little report. I think that's easier than stand here and you know tell the whole class about what's the paper about. So undergrad students can just do all written reports if they want. Um, that said, uh, you need to commit in the first two weeks of the class, whether if you're an undergrad, whether you want to just write reports or you want to participate in other roles as well. Maybe you like presenting in class, so it's up to you, but you don't need to tell me in the first two weeks, otherwise it's gonna be very hard for me to organize it. Um, the next thing you are going to be evaluated on is programming homeworks. I introduced these homeworks um, last year, we didn't have them. And um, I think it would be really, really helpful for you to try training models and try some of these methods that I have talked about before, as we go, basically, because after the fall break, you're going to start work on your projects. And what I want to avoid is that your project is, I trained the model, that's it. Or I try this method that it, it's really hard to uh, try it for the first time. So I understand how projects kind of turn, turn into something like that. So uh, I was motivated to introduce these homeworks. And the bad news or good news, I don't know, uh, is that the first assignment is already released and it's due in next Thursday. The reason for this is why I introduced this very um, you know, soon um, deadline is because I want you to try training a model soon and see whether this is something you can handle. I didn't introduce any formal prerequisites for this course because you all learn about machine learning and adjacent fields in different ways. And I really don't know whether you had uh, prerequisites that are needed for this class. But I do expect you have some kind of engagement with uh, machine learning or that you can hand, you know, kind of ramp up on PyTorch pretty soon. I wouldn't say there is anything terribly complicated in this uh, homework, um, but there are a lot of steps because I want you to, let me just open it. Maybe it's going to be easier with it like that. So just a second. So this is the first homework. I will make this larger. Okay. Okay, so what, what I want you to all uh, do is to kind of train a model, but not in a Jupyter notebook. I want you to write your training and evaluation script in a Python file uh, that's uh, going to be run on our CHPC cluster where our GPUs are. The reason why I insist on this is because basically there are two reasons. First of all, I will want you to try actual pre-trained language models of a decent size that we use in you know, NLP research or uh, in you know, anywhere in the industry these days. And if we work with Colabs, their availability of GPUs suitable for those kinds of language models is very finicky. 
Uh, so what might happen is that we all run off of those that, you know, availability to the GPUs and you can't do your homeworks, which would be really bad. But more importantly for me is that you kind of get more comfortable with doing this in a proper engineering way that you are going to kind of do this stuff uh, later on after this class. So this class is not about like, in, this is what, you know, we, we are not gonna go into super broad aspects of neural networks and transformers and training. So this homework is not super broad either. These are just the basics that I deem you, you will need. Uh, so some of you, this whole big preparation, you'll be, I know everything about this. Or you have slight variations and that's completely acceptable. So this part is more for students who have never done this before and they need some guidance. So they might need to go over these steps uh, slowly uh, one by one. But there is nothing complicated here. It's just about uh, running uh, certain commands such as SSHing to uh, Nodgepeak, which is one of our uh, uh, servers uh, here at the School of Computing, using Conda, uh, making Conda environments, um, checking that you have loaded your CUDA drivers on CHPC using Tmax and stuff like that. So I expect that a good portion of you will just skip this part because you know it. Uh, if you do not, if none of this sounds super familiar, please start working on this uh, soon. Uh, my office hours will be on Wednesdays at 10.30 and this, this, sorry, not Thursdays, Wednesdays on 10.30. Uh, I'm happy to be in the club, like a room. I'm trying to find one uh, this Wednesday and I'm happy to be there while you're trying these things. And if you run into any issues, I'm happy to help you. And then once you figure that all of out, you will fine tune one of the pre-trained language models for a task of sentiment classification and uh, do some error analysis, but you will be expected to run it on CHPC instead of uh, somewhere locally. <laughs> Again, I gave you instructions of how to do that. You will need to write a Python file with all the training and evaluation following another notebook that was written for another model and another task, but you will need to change just a few things and kind of compile everything in a file. And once you have that Python file, you will use this as it is here. So everything else becomes a little bit easier. So please check this assignment soon, like tomorrow would be great uh, because you might not have enough time if you are not super familiar with some of these things, especially the, the preparation part. Um, also have in mind that uh, training machine learning models takes hours. So if you are doing everything in the last moment, you might not be have enough time to train a model. So that's going to be an issue. And debugging these models is notoriously finicky as well. So I really recommend that you try with this, uh, start with this uh, early, early on. Okay. Um, for undergrads, I will drop your lowest homework score. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, for this assignment, what would be the criteria for yeah, so there are, uh, I will ask you to submit the Python file uh, that and your bash script that I can run on CHPC. I will just do, you know, uh, run it as batch that uh, bash file and I would check the outputs and it should be starting to train. If it just, if I just get errors, that's, that's not good. I probably won't wait hours for every single one of you. I'll just check that the initial loss values and um, and things look uh, decent. And then uh, there is other part, which is error analysis, where I ask you randomly sample 10 examples that your model incorrectly predicted. And I ask you to do a little analysis and write about it. And that's going to be the second part uh, of the evaluation, which is also helpful. You need to do select them randomly that kind of enforces that uh, I see that you have done your homework on your own and error analysis is something we always do after we train the model. Yeah, but it's all written there so in the in the doc. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then after the fall break, um, we'll have these four homeworks that will be like, first one will be train the model and then every single one of them 
will be about using explainability in techniques we have introduced in the class to explain such models uh, like the one we have trained in the first homework. So by the time we are done uh, with the first part of the course, we go to fall break, we come back from it, you will know how to use these things to some extent. So your projects then should go a little bit uh, beyond this. It's not just about training and applying these tech methods and the time frame for our projects will be very short, just a month. Uh, and in this month, I will expect that you train your model, that you produce some explanations, that you set up an interface where uh, your peers will be able to give you some feedback on your explanations. And I will tell you, at some point, we will have a lecture where I will go about how, which kind of interfaces we can use for something like this. This will be in-person session where first we'll have a session that I tell you how we go about this. Then we'll have another session where you here are going to try to uh, implement everything you need for your user study. And the third one will be us here giving each other uh, feedback on our explanations such that eventually the original project authors can say, this is how um, helpful my explanations were to my peers. So we will have a concrete numbers for our explanation utility at the end of our uh, projects. That's, that's the goal. And since that, that last bit is a little scary, you do need to have your, you know, predictions and explanations and study everything ready. Undergrads do not need to report these outcomes. If it kind of falls apart, it's okay. Uh, you know, as, as long as you have some kind of model and some explanations for undergrads only, that's, uh, that's okay. Any questions about projects? Projects are way long from today, so I don't wanna talk too, too much about them, but any immediate reactions? Okay, and I will have a final exam just because I think it's a good forcing function to kind of go over this course materials. I did notice that, you know, last year there was still some kind of confusion of which kind of method for what and what kind of uh, evaluation we can use it. I want to use this as a chance to be sure that you understand what these methods are and how to evaluate them is it's not going to be anything super difficult, but it will require you to kind of look at everything that we have uh, done uh, in the course. Okay, and for the last five minutes, um, I will open our syllabus. Everything you need to know is in there. So please, please carefully uh, go over it and read this uh, information uh, that, that is uh, in here. I will, from everything that's here, uh, I will mention just a few things today. One is communication. Uh, so uh, we will talk to each other on Piazza. I made this little table to kind of uh, guide you how and where you can uh, contact me. You will all, almost always contact me on, on Piazza. It just depends whether you are going to make a public post or you are going to make send me a private message. If there is something very, very urgent, send me an email just because I might see it uh, you know, more quicker. But uh, if you do not have urgent requests, please uh, use uh, Piazza. Is that clear? Uh, I personally for likely will not answer in the evenings. I definitely 100% will not answer during the weekend. Unfortunately, we don't have a TA for this class. So, you know, that, that will be, I think a little of, hiccups with uh, how fast the communication goes. So uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, I will do as much as I as I can. Um, but yeah, um, everything goes to Piazza. Um, and let me just quickly check one more thing. Um, please also review the submitting assignments that will be submitted to, to Gradescope. And there is a policy about uh, late, uh, late uh, assignments. You can, certain assignments that are not in person, and I specify exactly which ones, you can um, 
be late with two of them without any penalty. You don't need to send me any email or anything about that. If you are late two times up to 48 hours, that's uh, that's going to be uh, fine. Uh, but please check which one uh, are exempt from that. And it's mostly the in-person one. If you do need to submit something that we are going to use for our in-person activity, then it's impossible to be late because if you submit something after the activity is done, then, uh, then there is nothing you can do about it. So stuff like that. Um, yeah, and another thing you must read carefully is the uh, Carter School of Computing's policy about academic misconduct, which has this strike system. I don't know why this is shaking. And I feel like there is an earthquake. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, yeah, so you must read uh, this policy very carefully. Uh, I think the point where students get confused is what is collaboration, what is cheating. It is fine that you talk to each other about how you will go about assignments or projects or whatnot. But when it comes to actually coding and writing up to your solutions, you must do it on your own. And then it will become obvious that you have different submissions. If you are trying to also write them together, although you have contributed to your submissions, you're, it's, they're going to look like very, very similar. And it's going to be impossible for me to say whether you truly collaborated or not. So talk to each other, please. I think that's very important. But when it comes to actually coding, be separate entities. And I think everything is going to be OK. All right, that's all for today. And hope to see you again on Wednesday.